Praise the Lord, dear friends. I'm so happy that we were able to successfully complete chapter one of Philippians. And now we are moving into chapter two. Now, chapter two talks about imitating Christ's humility. Imitating Christ's humility. Now, this is a very important topic, uh, especially for all the Christians, believers, leaders, and pastors like me who are serving God. We should never allow our success to get into us, but we should always recognize and realize that it's all because of the grace of God. My teaching for you today will be based on Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, but I will deal with verses 1 to 4 and then continue. Now you will see Paul was facing his problems with people at Rome. Philippians 1, 15 to 18, as well as with people in Philippi. And it was the Philippian church problem that concerned Apostle Paul the most. He was more worried and disturbed about what was happening in the Philippian church. When Epaphroditus brought a generous gift from the church in Philippi and good news of the church's concern for Paul, he also brought the bad news of a possible division in the church family. Now that's the worst thing for any man of God to see if the church is going to divide in two or because of the division of the members within the church. I'm sure Apostle Paul, after all his hard labor and all his desire in establishing the Philippian church, would have been really shocked to hear the news from Epaphroditus. One side, he was happy, they sent him an offering, and he was very glad to know about the welfare of the church. But on the other side, when Epaphroditus told uh, to Apostle Paul about the division that was going to take place in the Philippian church, that really troubled Apostle Paul. There was a double threat to the unity of the church. What is, number one is, you can write it down, false teachers coming into the church from outside. Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. And secondly, disagreeing members in the church. Philippians 4, 1 to 3. So Philippians 3, 1 to 3, you will see about outside teachers, false teachers coming into the church and trying to bring division within the church. And secondly, disagreement within the church members. Uh, that really brought so much pain for Apostle Paul. I was talking to my son the other day and I was telling him, I said, Sammy, we don't need anybody's um, platform for us to build our ministry. I said, Dad has worked 
for over 38 years in the ministry, almost 43 years. And I have, and I have built up a large ministry purely in prayer, the word, fellowship, and strong administration of the church. But now when we allow people to come inside and spoil the growth and the beautiful establishment of the church, we should be very cautious about such people coming into the church. Because all these guest speakers, everybody, you know, may not be speaking in the same line as we are doing with the culture of the FGH church. So false teachers slowly started to creep in to the Philippian church and they brought a division because of their false teaching. And we, those who are listening to me, we've got to be so careful about the false teachers who come and destroy the doctrine you have learned from God. You know, the, the real doctrine of the church, what you have learned and seen and heard and grown, you got to be so careful in falling into the hands of the false teachers and diversifying yourself into a cultic group of people. So you got to be careful. The one danger which threatened the Philippian church was that of, can you tell me, disunity. Now when, the, when, when disunity comes within the church and the church members, then there will be there will be a suppression within the church for it to grow. When people don't like the church, they suddenly leave and they go away and they criticize the church and influence others also and sow wrong seeds to divert their minds uh, from being connected to the local church where they first belonged to. Now, this is an open attack for the church universally. But that is a heartbreaking thing for a pastor. Now, Apostle Paul was so hurt and disturbed about what he heard about the Philippian church. Such a beautiful church. How come false teachers entered? and disunity came in and finally what was going to happen to that church now there is a sense in which that is the danger of every healthy church every church that is growing well and establishing itself in the ministry this is like a virus disunity among brothers or the church members and false teachers coming in and slowly taking away people from the doctrine they have learned from the church. So imagine those who are listening to me, you got to be so careful in allowing yourselves to false teachers. Now, th that is really bad. We've got to be so careful in walking with God so that the Holy Spirit can help us in to work in line with the fellowship of the church. It is when people are really in earnest and their beliefs really matter to them that they are apt to get up against each other. And um, when your ideas do not agree, go together with the other believer, then what happens is they, trend, they tend to rise up against each other and form a small group 
either they stay there with that group and create more confusion or they just take the whole crowd and they go away. The greater their enthusiasm, the greater the danger that they may clash. Write it down. The greater their enthusiasm, the greater the danger that they may clash. Now imagine the greater you get excited about everything in your church and the group, there will be a, a great chance of people clashing afterwards. So we need to guard ourselves from such perils. And uh, we need to be very watchful. And that's why I believe one thing is prayer and praying in tongues, keeping the word and fellowshipping together in the house of God helps us so much to build up ourselves to another realm of ministry. It is against the danger Paul wishes to save God, his friends. I would say the same thing to all our members who are watching. I have seen in these years of ministry that how members have become, um, they have walked into the church not knowing anyone and just they have heard the word. Uh, they came on Sunday and the Lord touched them through my message and the ministry. And then they came, they met me and they started to come to church regularly. Then in the course of the time, I started to link them up with others within the church to create an, a group so that they could uh, grow together. And the outcome has always been people have become like a clique, like a, a small gang. And then uh, when one person out of that gang leaves the church, uh, they tend to pull away everybody out and they um, influence them negatively. A person who walked in not knowing the name of Jesus came to know the Lord Jesus and took baptism, grew in the church for several years. Suddenly, because of the influence of someone, they have just walked out of the church. Now, this is not good for a growing church and for believers who belong to a a church, basically. So I want you to uh, read with me Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Philippians 2, 1 to 4. The causes and cure of disunity. So what are the causes? Why people uh, live in disunity? And how can we cure disunity from within a church. Now, I would love to read uh, verses 1 to 4. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing, the word says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Now you see there, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. I hope you uh, read these verses, four verses. Paul, Paul pleads with the Philippian Christians 
uh, to listen to what he has to say so that they can open their spiritual ears to the teaching or to the guidance Paul was bringing to them. Paul is saying, if Christ has benefited you in any way, I beg you, listen to me. See there, has Christ benefited you? You walked into the church, you grew in the Lord, you came to know God, you were established so beautifully, and suddenly what happened? Christ, you have benefited through Christ. But now, why you have to bring your selfish reasons to cause disunity within the church? So Apostle Paul says, I beg you to listen to me. So, I want to take you to verses 1 and 2. Paul is piling up one on top of another in verses 1 and 2 as incentives to unity. So he says, if you follow these things, you can be united within the church. Many a times when people have some disagreement with other members within the church, they just walk out of the church. So we as pastors, when we call and talk to them, they say, we love you, we pray for you, we care for you. You are our father. But we don't want to come there because of these people. See there? So we need to be careful in maintaining our relationship with a church, whether it's 100 or 50 or 25 or 5, whatever the number doesn't make the difference, but the people will make the difference. And so Paul is saying, if Christ has encouraged you by being united to him, listen, united with Christ is the phrase Apostle Paul is using. Has Christ benefited you? Yes. So you be united with Christ. And the phrase is using here is en Christo. En Christo. Be united with Christ. And the word en Christo we see throughout Philippians and all of Paul's writings. The fact that we are all in Christ should keep us in unity because we all are united in Christ. How can I, you know, uh, be against another brother when he also is united in Christ? I am united in Christ. So we are all united together in Christ. So that's what Apostle Paul is trying to bring to the Philippian church. The fact, write it down, the fact that we are all in Christ should keep us in unity. No man can walk in disunity with his fellow men and in unity with Christ. Because I cannot say I am united with Christ and I am disunited with the believers. I cannot say that. I need to be united with Christ and I need to be united with other believers together. So many times in the ministry as pastors we go through a lot of hurts. But we should always keep one thing in mind, in common, that if you are a pastor, I am a pastor, we need to be united together. That is the only way we all can project our unity in Christ. You may disagree with some people, the way they 
look, the way they preach, the way they sing or deal with situations. But that should not be the cause for us to be disunited. You understand? So Apostle Paul, very clearly, he says, unity with Christ, unity with Christ will produce four things. Unity with Christ will produce four things. Number one, comfort. The word comfort or consolation. The Greek word is paramithion. Here Paul is particularly referring to the comfort derived from realizing that you are intensely loved by God. The word paramithion, P-A-R-A, para, M-Y-T-H-I-O-N, para, me, the, on. So the, the real meaning of this word is that I am, I, I receive a comfort because I am intensely loved by God. You see that? So because I have the deeper uh, love from God, I have that spirit of comfort within me. For whom we come to church? We come to church to worship God, isn't it? We come to church to glorify God. We come to church to listen to the word of God. So when we come together into the house of God to worship God and to live for God, then we should understand that our priority is to be within the church, to edify the church, and to edify one another. So the comfort we receive is from God. So Apostle Paul says, this unity what you have in Christ will produce comfort for you in your life. Number two, Apostle Paul says, because you are united with Christ, that unity will produce fellowship. Fellowship. Now, another word for fellowship is sharing. Now, in Greek, we have seen this word. All of you know this word? Koinonia. Koinonia means what? It's a fellowship. K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A. Koinonia. Now this Greek word used here, koinonia, means the fact that they share in the Holy Spirit should keep Christians from disunity. Now, the word koinonia means what? Fellowship. Okay? The Greek word koinonia means fellowship or sharing. Now, because we have the fellowship with one another, the Holy Spirit will keep the Christians from disunity. When people are... Uh, see, I've seen this. I'm... Uh, a founder of a church. So I have seen from day one how many people who have come and and they have, we encouraged them, introduced. I still remember one family came and I was, after service, I was going through all the newcomers' cards and then I saw and I, I literally separated the cards and gave to each uh, couple to go and visit their family. And this couple went and visited that family and said, Pastor Paul has sent us to visit you and he was very happy that you have come to church. So they were the ones to follow up. So they, they, those people came back to the church. They loved my preaching and the worship, the fellowship of FGAG. 
and they started to grow in God from a non-Christian background. And I assigned this couple to be in charge of them, to teach them. Now what happened when this couple uh, suddenly decided to leave our church and while they were going, they took all those people and they went away from the church. Now, this I have seen throughout my life in the ministry and this is basically a, a, a universal problem. It's almost like this coronavirus which is all over the world. It's like that. Every believer has this problem. But Apostle Paul is telling, when, when you are united with Christ, you have a fellowship with Christ. That means koinonia, you share together. Now, when you have the fellowship, you must understand that the unity is maintained by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we need to understand the Holy Spirit binds who the Holy Spirit who enables us to live that life of love which is the life of God. I want you to write it down. It is the Spirit who enables us to live that life of love which is the life of God. You wrote down? If a man lives in disunity with his fellow men, he thereby shows that the gift of the Spirit is not his. Now, Pastor Paul, we've been so hurt by so many. How do we deal with this? Now, how... how you, why you feel hurt? When yourself, your ego is punched in, you feel hurt, right? Now see there, we must understand that we are crucified with Christ. We don't live, but Christ lives within us. So when you come into a maturity in Christ, there are members in my church for 30 years. They are very faithful, rain or shine. They are here, they grow in God, they have a great blessing. But always there are few who do such things. Suddenly they go away. But we must understand that when you are united in Christ, you must cancel the spirit of disunity and you must cancel the spirit which causes division within the church. You walked out of the church, Fine, but don't call the church people and tell them, you know, we stopped coming and blah, 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 and then take them also and say, you also come uh, to play place where we are going. So what you are sowing is, you are sowing disunity and 100% you will never be fruitful in God's kingdom. So Apostle Paul is telling, the unity in Christ produces comfort, number two, fellowship. Number three, Apostle Paul says, the unity in Christ produces tenderness. Another word, compassion. Now the Greek a noun, splan konon, S-P-L-A-N, C-H-N-O-N, of the seat of your emotions, heart, the seat and source of love, sympathy, and mercy. Now see, that is tenderness. The tenderness of the seat of the emotions. Okay? Their tenderness. It's the seat of your emotions. Your heart. The seat and source of love, sympathy, and mercy. The power of Christian love should keep us in unity. Now, Christian love is that unconquered goodwill which never knows bitterness, 
and never seeks anything but the good of others. I, I, I ask you to write this down. Christian love is that unconquered goodwill which never knows bitterness and never seeks anything but the good of others. You see there? So as a believer, Apostle Paul says, don't seek for your own benefit. My chair is taken away, so I am angry. No. If your chair is taken away, be happy that somebody else is sitting there. But you can't be motivated with selfish reasons and, and try to say, uh, I live for God. It's very tough, right? It is not a mere reaction of the heart as human love is. It is a victory of the will achieved by the help of Jesus Christ. Now, just it's, it's not tenderness, it's not something like a reaction of heart. Like you see a, a documentary and you are moved and you cry and you feel so upset. That's the reaction of your heart, your emotions. But here Apostle Paul says, you have victory over your will achieved by the help of Christ Jesus. So that means we don't love the ones who love us alone. And we don't love the ones who like us. But we, the unconquerable goodwill even to those who hate us, to those whom we do not like. This is the very essence of the Christian life. If we can follow this principle, then all believers, we can live unitedly for the glory of Jesus Christ. We have so many churches all over the world and Christians must focus on unity within the church. Finally, Apostle Paul says, the unity in Christ brings compassion. The word compassion means sympathy. Is the Greek noun oitermos, oiktermos. O-I-K-T-I-R-M-O-S. Oik termers. That means display of concern over another's misfortune. Write it down. Display of concern over another's misfortune. Or pity. Or mercy. Or compassion. Now, when you join the word tenderness and when you join the word compassion, what do you get out of that? Tell me. You join the word tenderness and you join the word compassion. What do you get out of that? Tender compassion. Now, the human, the existence of human compassion should keep men from disunity. Tender compassion, both these words put together, should keep us away from disunity. Aristotle had it long ago, men were never meant to be snarling wolves, but to live in fellowship together. So, we are not supposed to be against one another. And it happens sometimes. I go for meetings and conferences and sit there and I see how people sometimes get up and they scream and shout and become so angry towards each other and they 
groupism. So when they sent me to bring healing to two groups of pastors, they were against each other like tooth and nail. I went and sat there and I heard them. Six hours they spoke. And with a lot of fasting and prayer, finally, God brought all of them together. Today that uh, area is doing very well. So what I'm saying to you is, these are all weapons the devil will use to destroy a growing church. So we need to be cautious. The more we are excited, the more damages we can create. So we need to be careful. You know, getting excited is good. But our excitement should not damage others and bring disunity within the church. Next week I will share with you about the negative side. Uh, what disunity will cause uh, among, why? Why the reason of disunity? Apostle Paul gives both. When you are united, you have all these things. When you are disunited, these are the things that are manifesting. So let's pray together today and ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Before I pray, I want you to support us in the ministry. In Jesus' name, I pray for everyone right now that you will touch them by your mighty power, that we will live in unity because of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.